What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. Find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. Email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Text us 865-658-5824. Join alongside Jacob up there in Wisconsin on the Minnesota border. Uh, good, to, good to have you in here this morning. Jacob, how you doing, Bo? I'm good. It's uh beautiful morning here in uh, Wisconsin. It's like 60 degrees. It's supposed to be around 75 again today. So uh, it's it's almost like, dude, if you live in Wisconsin, you get how all of a sudden it just snaps from one season to the next, like overnight. And that's kind of how it feels now. So absolutely, man. Any, anytime it, it finally turns the corner, there's, there's nothing better, man. I can hear the birds chirping outside. We got clear skies here. Going to be about 70 degrees, I think, today. So uh, I think we finally made it here in Tennessee anyway. But I'm um, excited about that for sure. Let's do this. Let's take a second give a shout-out to our sponsors today, and that is Ticket King, the official, official ticket provider of Packers Total Access Live. And uh, good morning, Lambo here. Wisconsin-based since 1992, specializing in Packers tickets. They are Wisconsin's largest ticket source. They got offices next to Lambeau Field as well as in Milwaukee. You can click on the link in the video description. That will send you to theticketking.com where you can register for free as a customer and be ready for that May schedule release as the Packers drop all the dates and you can get your tickets to Lambeau and, and even on the road too. So make sure you check it with ticket, check with ticket King. They're going to be able to save you some money over some of the bigger name companies for sure. Again, that is the ticket the official ticket provider of Packer fan total access. We appreciate, appreciate them supporting the show. All right, Jacob, you sent me something over this morning. That was really cool, man. Um, quarterbacks drafted here recently, right? and kind of talking about who may have panned out, maybe who haven't. We all know that the number one uh, the number one key to a successful NFL franchise is quarterback, right? It, it's it, there's so many, there's few and far between, right? That you have a Super Bowl winning team that you can look up and go, "Ah, he was an average quarterback," you know? Most of the time they're at least good. I say sometimes they're good, most of the time they're great. And obviously, you got people like your Tom Brady's, uh, your Aaron Rodgers, your Peyton Mannings that are just absolute legends that go on to win a Super Bowl. So um, this was kind of cool, man. People were going to be willing to take swings and, and spend a lot of draft capital, whether it's through a trade to get up to the right spot to take, quote unquote, their guy. But um, if you hit on them, obviously, you're going to have have a lot of success. If you miss on them, it does set your franchise back, but it doesn't mean you don't stop swinging, right? And it, this is really, really interesting here. It says quarterbacks drafted 2020 to today in the first round. So let's start all the way back at 2020. If you want to take it away here, Jacob, what, what kind of grabs your attention about this draft? You want to talk about? I mean, yeah, obviously, it's the one that features Jordan Love, uh, Justin Herbert, Tua, and our guy, uh, Mr. Joe Burrow. So. I remember when that draft came out, everybody was talking about how Burrow is kind of this once, you know, very, very unique prospect. Um, and that the other, I, I thought, I remember him saying that the rest of the class was maybe kind of a big unknown and they couldn't quite tell if they were going to transfer over. I think there was a lot of hype around Herbert, but as you all remember, nobody really gave, I, I don't think a lot of people even gave Tua a lot of credit, especially early, early yeah. in his career. Um, and Love, obviously, you guys know the roller coaster that we dealt with there. Um, but now to take a look back, you know, Hindsight being 2020 at the 2020 draft, it's uh, it looks like it was a pretty solid quarterback draft there. Yeah, that's the big thing that stood out to me, too. You know, you immediately think of like the Dan Marino draft. And I'm not suggesting any of these players are, are you know, going to finish with the top of accolades that Dan Marino or John Elway did. I believe John Elway and Dan Marino back in the day were in the same class. And that was like dubbed as one of the the best quarterback classes in the history of of the league. Um, but when you look at that 2020, again, man, like you said, Joe Burrow, obviously I think he's a hit. Um, if he had a little more talent around him, I think specifically on the offensive line, probably could have gotten over the hump by now. Obviously he stays banged up because he's getting battered around back there behind that that makeshift offensive line, at least in the first couple of years in the league. Tua Tunga Bailoa, I think he's gotten a lot of uh, a lot of criticism, and I think it's unwarranted. I don't understand the hate for Tua. I really don't. Um, he seems like a good leader. Um, he's got a quick release. He sees the field well. Um, it's like he knows where the ball is going. Now, like like many people have pointed out, the scouting report on Tua is get pressure in his face. If you can disrupt his timing, then you really throw his entire game off. He wants to be able to three-step drop, five-step drop, let that thing go, and, and get the ball out on time to his playmakers. Um, I don't really understand the hate for him. Justin Herbert, I think he is a great 
quarterback you know, could possibly be better than Burrow in the long run. We're going to see what Jim Harbaugh can do with him up there, uh, you know, or I should say over there in L.A. now with the uh, with the uh, Chargers. Um, I think he's going to thrive under Harbaugh. And, and the reason I say this is because people forget how much success Jim had as a coach in the league. Like, we always talk about the winning percentage of Matt LaFleur, right? Jim did it. I believe more years, if I remember correctly, in the league, and he has a higher winning percentage than than Matt Lafleur. And that's not the dog Matt Lafleur; it just shows you how good Jim has been as a coach. I think Herbert's going to take that next step. And then, of course, our boy Jordan Love. Um, man, those last nine games, I can't wait till I can say, "Man, last year," you know what I mean, rather than just those last nine games, because the things he did in the second half of the season, Jacob, man, it was it was some. I don't want to say historic, but it was. It was on that MVP level. It really was. And well, again, I, yeah. I honestly do think that parts of it was historic. Um, but look who it is. Look at who's dusting man. off. My man. So, anyways, yeah, I, I really do think that that, like you talked about the second half, I I, I know certain stat lines, um, it was historic. Like, he was doing stuff that nobody had done in that stretch. Um, like you talked about, though, it is – I was thinking about this the other day because since we drafted Love, his whole knock the first year was always – you don't know what he is because he's not going to get playing time. Second year, it was like, oh, you can't tell if it's just a flash in the pan. The third year, it's like, you know, he played a couple good games, but we don't really know if it's anything to write home about. But after he has his first year as a starter, we'll know whether or not we have Jordan Love. And then the first half of the year, he's kind of meh. In the back right. half of the year, he's literally one of the best ever. And you're just like, okay. Uh, I guess we're still kind of like have one foot in, one foot out on Love. So I'm not personally. I think that as he grew in the system and maybe kind of things slowed down for him. I think that shows his actual talent level. So I think that coming into this next year, he's going to show put together a full year. Like you talked about. Yeah, definitely. We got Tim joining us now in the Mecca green Bay. Room. Good morning. <laughs> How we doing this morning, Tim? That's me right now, bro. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember if you were going to be on or not. So I was like, you know what, let's just roll. And if he jumps in, great. Jacob's got to cut out of here in a, in a few minutes. He's got some uh, some plans this morning. So I'm glad you jumped on here, buddy. Um, we're just talking about the the quarterbacks drafted from 2020 to today. Jacob found this graphic. We're kind of hitting on it. Obviously, 2020 class. I don't think it's a coincidence either that the class that's the oldest or the ones having the most success too. You know what I mean? It's like – they had kind of a little bit of time to to get their feet under them. Um, now, when you look at 2021, uh, Trevor Lawrence, obviously, they've got him as a check mark. I think I would agree with that. I think he's a good starting quarterback. I don't think he's great. I don't think he's, you know, on any kind of Hall of Fame trajectory as it sits right now. Uh, the biggest thing about Lawrence, if I remember correctly, is he doesn't have – the yards per attempt, meaning he doesn't push the ball down the field as effective. It's not that he can't. It just hasn't kind of been there, if I remember correctly. Um, Wilson, who is Wilson, Jacob? You, I'm trying to remember who Wilson was. Zach. Zach Wilson. Oh, yeah, that's that's why it was easy to forget, right? So <laughs> who is he still on the Jets? Am I thinking? Uh, right? I think that I think he is, but I, I know that it, they're just about ready to get rid of him. I know that. Yeah, they're trying to trade him, if I understood correctly. So I think he still is technically on the Jets roster. Then you got Trey Lance, of course, who is now no longer with the San Francisco 49ers. He's down there in Dallas. Kind of weird setup there. Trey Lance in Dallas, right? And they're now talking about Dak might not get extended. So it's almost like have they seen something in Trey Lance to suggest, hey, look, there's no reason to break the bank for Dak Prescott? I personally disagree with that. I'm kind of a Dak Prescott fan. I think he's a good quarterback, me personally. Um but uh, then you've got Justin Fields, of course, who is now in Pittsburgh. And then I'm assuming that's Daniel Jones, I believe. Um, it's Mac Jones. It's a, oh, Mac, Mac Jones. Jones. Okay, that was Mac. Got it. When was Daniel Jones taken? That was several years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that was back in 2018, 2019, I thought. Got you. Okay, cool. So, all right, there you go. So, obviously, in the 2021 class, it looks like one of the five you would consider a hit at this point. Tim, what do you think about that 2021 class or anything you want to add to 2020? Pretty cool that. You, you you know, you trade up just a touch and get Jordan Love, and he's one of those four that hit in 2020. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, 21 is uh, – that's cheeks right there. I, I, I would agree. I'm with you. Trevor Lawrence probably uh, probably gets the check mark there. Um, but, uh, you know, hey, man, J-Money's the truth, dude. 
I've, I've believed it from the moment we had him. I'm, I'm going to sound just like Goody here. Well, when did you know? When did you know Jordan Love was was talented? Eh, around 2019, <laughs> 2020. Um, no, but in all seriousness, um, yeah, I, I would agree so far with this list. Seems pretty accurate. It's funny you mentioned that too about Jordan Love because last year I don't remember anyone other than you saying, no, Jordan's a guy, Jordan's a guy, Jordan's going to be great. Like, I remember there being so much skepticism. And and I think if you got a couple daddy sodas in old uh, Brian Gutekunst, he would say, you know, yeah, last year we – it's what he was saying at the first year. We got to see what, how he reacts. We got to see what we got. Now, all of a sudden, it's – I knew in 2019. So, I kind of have to push back a little bit on his comments. But then you never waver, dude. There's no two ways about that. You, the look in your eye when people in the chat was going, let's see what Sean Clifford can do was hilarious. <laughs> You're ready to kill people. So, anyway. um, 2022, I didn't realize that uh, – well, first of all, back to 2021, Mac Jones, obviously, that was Kyle Shanahan's top choice, and the organization kind of overrided him, right? They, they, they were like, no, as an organization, we're, we want Trey Lance. And many people that year – as Trey Lance, his first year starting, kind of struggled, it was like, you should have listened to Kyle, you should have listened to Kyle. No, they were both bad, okay? There you go. So it didn't really matter who they took there. Of course, they got Mr. Irrelevant there and Brock Purdy to kind of lead that franchise now. Um, 2022, that's wild. There was only one quarterback taken in the first round to show you how weak that class was. Obviously, that was uh, our boy Pickett up in Pittsburgh, who is now with Philadelphia. Is that right, Jacob? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh and was real excited to be a backup, which really struck me as odd. Like, what in the world, dude? Why would you ever put that comment, whether you believe it or not, why would you put that comment on tape? Anybody who might want to sign you in the future, and you're like, yeah, I'm in the right place now. Come over here backing up, uh, you know, whoever it is. I think it's Russell Wilson, I guess. Or no, not Russell Wilson. Who is it that he's backing up? uh, Jalen. Yeah, Jalen. I get the Pittsburgh teams or the uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh teams mixed up all the time. So that's that's obviously a bad quarterback class there. And then 2023, the question's still out on a couple of these players. And Bryce Young had just absolute crap surrounding him the entire year. Uh, it's going to be hard to see. And he's kind of in that that water too, Jacob. Where you know you think you think back to like David Carr back in the day, where the yeah. team was so bad around him. It's like he could have been a great quarterback. He just got beat all to hell. What do you think about Bryce Young? early on here and I don't know um I think it's easy to definitely put the blame on the lack of talent around him but his his overall size the way that he moves in the pocket it just didn't seem like he was comfortable at the NFL level um but -hmm. like you said I mean the guy was pretty much running around for his life throwing a second and third string receivers that they touted as their first string receivers I mean um (laughs) I don't know. I I think that definitely I'd give him another full year and, and see what he's doing. But at this point, if I had to take a guess, he's trending towards being a. Eh. Yeah. And, you know, with Bryce Young, he was my top graded quarterback. He was actually my top graded player in that draft. And when I did the quarterback breakdown of, of all the top quarterbacks in that draft that could potentially go in the first round, I remember C.J. Stroud being the best passer. Right. And Bryce Young was the better overall prospect. Like there's probably a little more experience there, a little more upside. But again, I think it just kind of shows you, you put Bryce Young into a team. I think if I remember correctly, Coach Reich, Reich was the coach. And then obviously they run him out of town, so he's gone now. So it's obvious they didn't have the right coach in place. And then you look at C.J. Stroud in Houston, and obviously Tim D'Amico Ryans is the guy. Like he's he's going to be a great coach. It's at least everything we've seen so far. So, um, what do you think about this? Of course, Anthony Richardson getting hurt last year. Um, you know, kind of cut his season short there. What do you think about that, though, Tim? You agree with that that listener in twenty twenty three? Yeah, I I'm kind of with you guys here with uh, Bryce Young. I think physically he's you know. <sighs> I don't know. I feel like they didn't do him any favors, you know, and he probably did the best he could with what he had around him. And, you know, to Jacob's point, you can use that as an excuse if you want. Um, But I feel like, yeah, seeing another year with him, um, we'll get a better understanding. But um, CJ Stroud, man, that dude is just, I mean, I, I, I got this like sneaking feeling that we're going to see, we're going to see a Jordan Love Bryce Young Super Bowl at some point. 
You mean CJ Stroud or CJ Stroud uh, Super Bowl at some point? And, um, you know, to your point, D'Amico Ryans is a defensive, you know, juggernaut when it comes to the to the game. But, you know, he's also stepping into his own as a head coach here and putting the pieces in place there. And, um, you know, Houston, uh, they they're the real deal in the AFC. So, um, you know, they kind of put a lot of teams on notice. We're seeing the change as we go towards the future here with these uh, young quarterbacks and new coaches. So uh, I, I do. I got this sneaking suspicion we might we might see that C.J. Stroud and and Jay Money. I saw a really cool breakdown. It was just like a I don't know what you call it nowadays. Just a video on Instagram or something of a guy who <clears throat> he said uh, to take a look at how crazy the Texans like basically turning over their franchise within a year. It stemmed it and he, he says it all traces back to if you guys remember at the very last game of 2022 season they were playing i think it was the colts or something like that basically they had to lose and they should have lost and they're in position to lose but lovey smith decided to take it down the field with like one minute left throw a touchdown pass not obviously him i can't remember who it was but threw, they threw a touchdown pass over the middle like a long bomb won the game within the last couple seconds kicked them into the number two spot which then obviously the bears traded up for the first or whatever they ended up in the in the number two spot. I can't remember exactly how they got there. They went and take C.J. Stroud when Tobiko Ryan's then gets pushed into that, and then they come back, traded back into three, took Will Anderson. Then they get themselves the offensive player of the year, the defensive player of the year, and it's like, dang, that's one way to completely revamp your organization, like literally overnight. Yeah, Will Anderson was one of my favorite prospects too. I I have my top fifty from that year saved in the database, but we've got so many images there now with the draft you know, quickly approaching. I had to take it down. Will Anderson was right at the top of the list for me. Like I said, C.J. Stroud was – I think I had him as the second best quarterback, if I remember correctly, behind Bryce Young. But he was the best passer, the better passer, like I said. So, um, I Houston's building it right. They really are. Ron Sample says, Goody was only half serious when he said when he said he knew in 2019. I, I think that's probably true, Ron. I do. Uh, you know, it, sometimes it's hard to – to read the, the sarcasm, but um, when he said it, I knew in 2019, it was like some people took it as serious and they ran with it going, you didn't know that. And it's like, okay, let's just everybody calm down here a second. All right. He hit on him. That's all that matters. Right. Tim, we hit on the quarterback. It seemed like, so we're good. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Ron Sambo also said Bryce Young is so small to take that beating. Very good point. You look at CJ Stroud. He's a grown ass man. And yep. uh, you know, obviously, uh, he just he's someone who can take a few more hits. He gets the ball out quick. He had a he had a really quick release, lightning quick release. So uh just had some of those things. Again, the four things that we talk about is most important for a quarterback in the NFL is accuracy, pre-snap read, post-snap read, and quick release. Those are the big things. Notice we never mention arm strength. I think people that make it to the NFL level have enough arm strength to play at that level. Uh they might not have the Brett Favre cannon where you can whistle it through three defenders, but again, there's no coach out there drawing up a play going, all right, guys. We're going to throw this thing in a triple coverage here. <laughs> so you want someone to play with rhythm, play with timing, be able to read the defense pre-snap, those post-snap rotations, have the accuracy to get the ball where you need to, and, of course, have the quick release as the rush is bearing down on you. So um, let's see here. Uh, ben Holden said, NFL teams have a problem of playing these quarterbacks too soon. It's so true, Ben. It's so true. It's where, it's where they screw up over and over and over. Um, C.J. Stroud is kind of the exception, you know. But, again, you put a decent team around them with some good leadership, kind of understand their role and what they need to do. Makes sense. Uh, Ron Sample says Stroud is a cool customer. I completely agree. Um, he goes on to say cooler than the other side of the pillow. Love it. little Stuart Scott there for you. Rest in peace, Stuart. Um, the thing I love about C.J. Stroud is one of the things I love about Jordan Love. Um, they're both – they're not ashamed to talk about what's important to them and what they kind of stand up for and believe in, you know. Uh, both are Christians, and they'll tell you that. I don't know if you've seen one of the post game uh, interviews last year. C.J. Stroud, first thing he said, "I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ." Of course, they cut that out of the interview when they played it back a hundred times, which is really odd that they would do that. But anyway, um, it was cool that uh, he kind of stands up for that. Obviously, Jordan Love with Stacy Dells in training camp last year said he wears a bracelet, right? One of those arm bracelets that says "I am second, meaning God is first. So I love that those two guys are just willing to kind of step out their own faith and like, look, here's how I believe. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. Everyone else is allowed to give their opinion on their belief system. Why the heck can't we? I really appreciate that. I do. So um, let's see here. Pete M. Packers have a home game versus the Texans this year. Super Bowl preview? Question mark. There you go, Tim. That'd be exciting, right? Um, 
that's going to be one of the hallmark games this year, Jacob. Think about that. You're going to have one of the great young teams. Is that loops? I love it. <laughs> um, you're going to have one of the great young teams in the, well, two of the great young teams, really, right? Probably two of the younger teams in the league. And obviously, D'Amico Ryan's up and coming coach going up against Matt LaFleur, uh, one of those guys that has the highest winning, one of the highest winning percentages amongst active coaches. You got two of the great young quarterbacks going at it. Um, obviously, you're going to have Jeff Halfley's new defense kind of unveiled this year. And then, of course, D'Amico Ryan's leading his defense there with, like you said, Will Anderson and some of those guys. Jacob, what do you what do you think about that home home game against the Texans? It'd be really cool if that's like the home opener or something, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean it's, it's definitely, definitely getting a little different because um, I think that the, the I, like you just talked about, they might have the two best young and up and coming offensive rosters. I think for sure, um, mm-hmm. cause a lot of times people forget, you know. They brought in Joe Mixon. They have Tank Dell that they also got in that draft. I mean, talk about that was a good draft for them. They also had Nico Collins, who's now um, kind of their quiet number one, who's actually been pretty darn good. And they brought in a, um, a good tight end. I can't remember who it was, but um, a decent one there. I think it's Dalton Dahl- Schultz. So they've got a really solid lineup there. And like this draft, I know that they're going to build just like we are. Um, I'm looking for us to maybe just add a few puzzle pieces here and there. And one of them we've talked about, I think if our offensive line gets revamped, that we'll have on paper a better offense than most people were going to face this year. So I think it'll be an intriguing matchup. Um, it'll be just fun to see, like you said, the two young guys kind of go at it. I like seeing D'Amico Ryans. He's obviously going to be a, a defensive-minded coach. We're going to have Halfley in there doing his thing. So it's just going to be a lot of cool dynamics to watch. Yeah, I completely agree, man. Um, so, yeah, we got uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Haffa in the chat. Morning, guys. Good morning, Mark Zambito. Good morning, Richard King. Good to see you guys. Hope y'all got you a cup of diesel ready to go here. Um, let's do this. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit. You know, we talked about a graphic that was shared for me by Steve Cook, I believe was his name on Twitter. And we kind of keep referring back to it. When you look at the ESPN analytics breakdown of the draft day predictor, you can just pick a draft pick and say, all right, who's the who's got the highest chance of being drafted there? Tyler Gotten ran away with it for the Packers at number 25. And you guys know I've talked about he's um, a little bit lower on my board. I'm going to explain why, but I also want to kind of show you where he sits on other people's boards. Okay, so let's start off with the 33rd team. Tyler Gotten's in the 27th spot, the fifth best offensive tackle. He's got a 67 grade. What's cool about this, he sits alone in the 67 grade column. So you've got Joe Alt with a 70. You've got J.C. Latham with a 69. You've got Fashanu and Fuaga at 68. And then Tyler Gotten at a 67. Now, another guy that keeps getting kind of mocked there, or I'm sorry, the predictor is mentioned, is Amarius Mims. He's the, the, the second highest guy here, right, if I remember correctly. So if Amarius Mims is a 66, then that that kind of suggests, all right, Tyler Gotten should be the better prospect there, right? Now you also got uh, Sua, Sua Matai, I think is how you say it, at a 66 as well, and then it breaks on off to a 65 grade. So Tyler Gotten is in the 27 spot, which is right there in that ballpark for 25, right? So that's where he sits on the 33rd team. Now let's go ahead and hop over to the PFF's big board here, and let's see where they've got him at. PFF has Tyler Guyton. We scroll down here. He is sitting in – all right, so there's the 25 spot, the 30 spot. So once again, real close, right? Really, really close. This is the thing that I don't like about Tyler Guyton, and the reason he drops on my board is PFF's grades – have him as a 69, a 66, and a 63. There were 203 tackles that graded higher than him in 2022, and then there was 262 tackles that graded higher than him in 2023. Yet the website that does the grading has him listed as 30th. That may kind of catch people as like, what the world? And it's something we don't talk about a lot, but a real thing in the league, Jacob, I know you're going to have to hop off here in a minute. When you do, you just go, buddy. I want to get your take on this, though. You know, it's one thing to – my board is set up based off of the past. What have they done? What production? You know what I mean? Like, what what have we seen in them in the past? And what GMs are trying to do is they're trying to get a projection. What can he become? What will he become, right? There's something they see in Tyler Gotten, and I say they meaning – Several different places. We can go to the consensus big board as well. The consensus big board, um, I'll leave this up for the 
for the grade purposes. They have him in the 30 spot and he peaked at 24, right? So it's obvious that someone sees something in his upside there being Tyler Guyton. Jacob, what do you think about this, man? It, I'm trying not to sell myself on Tyler Guyton, but there's so many people that see him around that 25 to 30 spot that it seems legit like he's going to be drafted in the first round potentially. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like you talked about, there's a lot of projection that I think these um, – these lists, especially, I, I feel like the position of tackle too, just always seems like it's one where they're willing to take like a, what do you want to call it, like a, to take a, a, a flyer on a guy just to right, see a little bit of a gamble, right? A little bit of a gamble, because I mean, if you look at, I didn't realize the dude's six eight, like that's a massive human being. Um, so maybe just the all together skills being that large and that athletic, they just feel like if he gets the right coaching, that they can tweak techniques and that they can make him into a really solid starter. Personally, I don't. I don't see the hype there. Um, I'd much rather if he were to fall into the second or something like that, then yeah, I think I'd, I'd be okay with that. It's just, you guys know how I am. I'd like to either trade back. I definitely, <clears throat> I could see if we had like trade up like three or four picks and get that guy, I would just be like, Ugh. like that'll be probably my worst case scenario for the draft is if we trade up even just like minutely to get a player that I don't want, that would be, and then, you know, depending on what we have to give away too, I'll just, I'll pull my hair out. But, other than that, I'm pretty excited about like any possibility in this draft. I just, I just don't want. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they take Tyler Gatton, but for me, I hope they don't. You know, and again, it does, obviously, if Goody thinks he's worthy of the 25th pick, if they don't trade around here, then you know what I mean. More power to him. He he was a top 30 visit and a Senior Bowl participant, so he is marked on airs as like okay, high probability he could get drafted by the Packers. Now he's sitting in the 61 spot on my board, and the, and the main reason is because of those PFF grades. Without the PFF grades, he would probably be sitting right around the 30 spot, maybe even the 28 spot on my board. Again, he scored over a nine RAS. Tim, we know how Goody loves his RAS guys there in the uh, in the first round, don't he? Yep, absolutely. And I, I mean, I echo the same sentiment. I mean, I hope, I hope he's not the pick. I really do. I mean, if we, if we end up with him, I, I don't know. I just fingers crossed here. I don't know. Hey, he's a big old boy though. Six, seven, three twenty-seven. Yeah. My goodness gracious, dude. That's a, that's a horse cat right there. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of hit on that because we talked about that predicted pick. Let's go to the chat real quick, see what everybody's saying. Um, let's see here. Ron Sample says, Gotten seems like a smooth athlete for a big guy. That's probably what Goody's seeing too, what other GMs are seeing across the board, I would imagine. Uh, Coach Lynn says, no Gotten at 25. And it could be something too, Coach, that they're they're taking a look at him to go, okay, let's say they do have him more in the 50s or 60s like I do. And they're going, okay, let's just take one more look at him because everybody sees him as a first-round worthy pick, right? Almost like let's try to cross him off the 25th list, right? And then maybe you could take him with 41 or, or possibly 58. I would feel really good about him at 58. But, again, 25 is just a little too rich for me. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um We'll move off of the gotten talk here. Here's a question from Ben Holden. As we look at draft classes, what is the strongest position this year? Goody usually picks that position. He said offensive tackle, question mark. What I'm hearing is, and again, I don't go and watch all the tape and put a grade on everybody. I've got a handful of guys that I trust in their evaluation. They're constantly doing the legwork, so I kind of lean on them. People like Greg Cosell, Daniel Jeremiah, folks like that, right? Um, and I love to look at the PFF grades because – it's few and far between that I look at a PFF grade and go, no, nope, that guy's way better than that PFF grade. It's almost always you can watch the tape and go, I can see that grade. Um, but for me, it sounds like it is wide receiver, offensive tackle, and cornerback are the real heavy spots. Now, obviously, we don't need a wide receiver. That would suggest – that a good player that we need will fall in our lap at a position of need for us because other people are going to be trying to grab those top tier wide receivers. Offensive tackle, obviously we could use one. If you get if you get one that is and the way I see this, if you can get a, a right tackle that is better than Sean Ryan at right guard or better than Josh Myers at center, to me it's worth it because you can now plug and play him at right tackle and kick Tom over there. Now you guys know that talk keeps kind of ramping up. Now, people like Mike Wald, if I understood him correctly, he doesn't see any of these offensive tackles as being better 
than what we currently have, meaning like a Rashid Walker, that type, someone that could, you know, be it would be worth moving Zach Tom on. So uh, it might be something that you stay away from offensive tackle and you take an interior offensive line in the second or third round, plug him into right guard, and you're off to the races. But um, I don't know. What do you think, Jacob? What do you think the strength of this class is on the surface, man? So you think of- I'm trying to look right now for a tweet that I shared a few – I can't even remember. But, um, oh, gosh, there's that giant bug tweet. Good. Um, I was looking for it because Dane Brugler, I'm a giant fan of his, kind of like how you talk about Cosell and, and Jeremiah. I really value what um, Dane Brugler does <clears throat> for the athletic. He has like a 400 uh, person uh, deep dive that he does on all these prospects. So basically his top 100, I want to say that there was like 17 tackles. I think the next highest one was either, like you said, cornerback or then the next was wide receiver. Um, but it was shocking how many tackles were in that top 100. But I, I think the top three definitely was tackle, cornerback, and wide receiver. And that was kind of crazy because the wide receiver draft is crazy long this year. Of course, the year that we are stacked to the gills of wide receivers, but on any other, like, they're talking that a lot of these guys that are even going to be <clears throat> picked, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh best wide receivers that they could in another draft be, you know, top 30 prospects kind of stuff. So, Yeah, for sure. Tim, what do you think, man? What, what do you think's deep here in this? And I want to say this about Dane Brugler. If I understood correctly, Jacob, he has over 2,000. That's why they call it the beast. He has over 2,000 prospects that he's graded. Yeah, it's wild. Go ahead, Uh, Tim. What do you think about – what do you think is the deepest position in this class? Uh, I would go uh, O-line. Yeah, probably tackles Um, or or even interior. There's some good value at interior O-line in this draft as well. And then, yeah, I would say probably receiver and and corner um, in this draft for sure. His receiver – it's tough. It is, Brett. We've got 12 offensive tackles, according to the 33rd team, 12 offensive tackles in the top 100 with a 65 grade or higher. And, again, that 65 grade, this, is, this isn't this is something the 33rd team just came up with. This is how front offices actually grade players, right? Um, they don't give them A's. They don't give them a C or C minus. They do it on a numerical system, and there's, and there's a, a whole criteria they have to hit, right, to – to kind of hit these points, but uh, that's a lower end starter. So they're saying 12 tackles that are starting caliber <laughs> players. So um, that's really, really interesting. Now, if we look at cornerback and again, you know, cornerback, I guess it's similar to tackle. You, you've pretty much got two starting at all times with possibly a third being in the nickel. Um, let's see how many they got in the top 100 here real quick. They've got 15 cornerbacks in the top 100. So it kind of shows you tackle cornerback. Now, to kind of draw a comparison, let's go to like defensive line. Okay. Let's go defensive tackle and see how many are in the top 100. Only eight. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it just shows you where the depth is according to the 33rd team. Again, it doesn't mean the 33rd team is the, te- you know, the, the, the be all end all or anything. It's just, I love the way that they approach it like a front office does, as opposed to people trying to get creative and, and create their own systems but um, so if we if we do in fact trade up for some reason do we do we target a defensive tackle see that's the thing right you're if you're let's say in the first round receivers quarterbacks and offensive tackles fly off the board i think there's a good chance that happens before we pick and that's how you end up having like a johnny newton or a byron murphy potentially drop to you right so if we looked at it from that perspective as a defensive tackle and we'll keep uh, nose tackles out of it right now. There's Johnny Newton and Byron Murphy. You see they're both borderline top 20 picks, okay? And if one of those fall to you and you're picking at 25, specifically like a Johnny Newton, if you believe Johnny Newton is better than Byron Murphy the way the 33rd team is, you're getting the best defensive tackle in the draft. Now, it still comes down to the grade that Goody's got on him. Does he have a 67 on him? Goody may have a 70 on him. You know what I mean? If that's the case, those players that are with those uh, 70 or higher, your Marvin Harrison Juniors, your Caleb Williams, your Joe Waltz, your Malik Neighbors, probably even your 69s, to be honest with you. Roma Dunze, J.C. Latham. If 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 Goody has, let's say, a 69 grade on, you know, uh, Fuaga, right, and he falls within striking range, that's where you're looking at trading up. That's exactly what happened with Jordan Love. If right. you tried to look at this year's draft and say, okay, what grade did they have on Jordan Love? My guess is they probably had a 68 or a 69 on Jordan Love, and that's where they were like, we cannot pass this up, right? And, again, it's Jordan Love's a perfect example, Jake, when we talk about, like, projecting. GMs aren't going, okay, well, who had the most success up to this point? That's how my board's set up, 
And that's a great starting point. But now it turns into what are we projecting these players to do? Have they already hit their ceiling? Do they have a higher ceiling than the other? Can we pull that out of them? What? How Do their traits match up with what we want to do offensively? Are we going to play a rhythm offense? Are we going to play more of a boot action? We need mobility, throw on the run, that type of stuff. Um, if you're going to have someone who's just doing a three-step, five-step drop, let that thing rip, they got to have quick release, right? they got to have good accuracy. So traits kind of have to match up. But um, what do you think about that, Jacob? Do you think uh, – I wonder what grade they had on Jordan Love for them to go, yep, he's worthy of a first-round pick. Not only that, we'll give up a fourth-round pick to get up and, to climb up and get him. I really would love to see that one day if there isn't – I don't know, like you said, I don't even know how they quantify their board, like if they use the same grading scale, if they use a number system, whatever. But I would – I'd would, I'd pay some money for sure if I could yeah. actually sit down with Goot and be like, yo, just tell me, what was it? Like, actually – Yeah, I'd love to see their draft board, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be absolutely awesome. They'll never let that happen. But <laughs> um, maybe someday the story will be told about why they took Jordan Love, you know, so early. Um, do you, do you know, cool. is, it, is it like do teams have they ever shown like, hey, this is what our horizontal board looked like for the 2020 draft? No, it's four years past. You know what I mean? Like, right. do you think any organizations have ever done that? Because it'd be really interesting just to see how they match up. Hey, Goody, can we see your draft board? <laughs> I'm not going to, so quit asking. What's, what's interesting about that is when they hired Brian Gutekinds as the general manager, Mark Murphy, it, it was basically the, the information came out that the way Mark Murphy decided on Brian Gutekinds is he went to every – they like to have their general managers have a scouting background. That's something that kind of historically has happened in Green Bay. Um, they want to build through the draft rather than free agency, and obviously it's worked out pretty nice. But what he, what Mark Murphy said was they had everyone bring their scouting reports, and Goody hands down had the best – like when you looked at the players he had the highest grades on, he was the one that was like hands down he's the best scout in the room. That's our general manager. So kind of show you how they went about selecting him as the general manager over, you know, say a Russ Ball or an Elliot Wolf. I know there was many people upset they didn't choose Elliot. What it tells you behind the scenes, Mark Murphy, as he does sometimes, he says the quiet part out loud. He basically said, Goody smoked Elliot Wolf's head in the scouting reports. <laughs> Goody's our guy, right? Um, and obviously, yeah. Elliot Wolf goes over to New England. He's now kind of their their personnel director over there. It's, it's weird they're set up. They're trying to decide on an actual GM. They got a couple guys, kind of like we do here. You know, with Russ Ball handling the salary, and then obviously uh, Goody making the selections. So you want uh, your football guys to be your football guys, and you need your numbers guys and your your business guys. You know, surrounded in that organization as well. So yeah, gotta and have that balance. People make fun of draft day, but and I know it's kind of cheesy, but Jacob, what was Jennifer Garner's role in that? She was kind of the cap guru, right? Remember, he looked at, her, hey, can we make this work? Yeah, we can make this work. I'm not suggesting that we do a Photoshop of uh, of our boy uh, Russ Ball's head on Jennifer Garner's body, but kind of think in that regard, right, Jacob? That's how it, that's how it was set up. Was like that was their Russ Ball. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's cool about the movie is like it takes you behind the scenes. If you if you can get around kind of the cheesy love story that's involved in it, you can kind of see this is this is similar to how NFL teams are are structured, if you will. Again, I don't think scouts are in there acting the way they're acting in the draft room and stuff. They, they try to add a little comedy to it, obviously, a little personality. But. It's a good movie, and I love because they incorporate – it's all NFL staff, and like you can tell right. that NFL licensed everything to them. They use actual players. Um, it's fun. If Yeah, if you just got to turn your brain off and stop being like, this isn't realistic, it's a movie. Just yeah. eat your popcorn and it's, enjoy the movie. Yeah, just enjoy the movie, guys. Gosh. Um, Prince in the chat said they don't like cameras in the war room for a reason. I was trying not to laugh while you were talking about this, Jacob, but this is so true. I was going to say this. SDM40 said the Cowboys board was caught on camera a few times. So you can pull those images and kind of see where they had players, um, you know, graded on their board. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of information out there. The thing I like about Michael Lombardi is he gives you that inside information. He talks about the grading seal. There was one episode where him and Femi Abimafe broke down how quarterbacks are graded, what a 70 is, what a 68 is, what a 69 is, what a 67 is, all the way down the board. Um, really cool stuff there. I know a lot of people don't like Michael Lombardi. The, the reality is he has three Super Bowl rings. He's been a part of three Super Bowl organizations. 
I think he only won one. I can't remember how many he won with with uh, New England, but he was on staff with Bill Walsh back in the day. He was on staff with Al Davis. Uh, he went to Cleveland. He was with, in Cleveland with uh, with Belichick when they went on their run there before they ended up moving the team to Baltimore and cutting all the staff. Obviously, he was with him there in New England. Um, it's, it's still amazing to me how people dog him. And they act like he's a buffoon that doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's literally going around the country speaking at, you know, we're getting paid tons of money to speak, to have speaking engagements. But, you know, the random Joe on Twitter knows more than him. It's just, it's mind boggling. Very brash attitude. Don't get me wrong. He's not a guy I would want to spend time with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you got to respect the fact that he kind of made it to the top of the mountain. And, uh, and it at least was a GM for one year too. He's been in those draft rooms multiple times. So. Um, dead fish. You got it, buddy. He says, got to watch draft day, the Wednesday before the draft. It's about time for me to put it on loop here. Jacob, when do you start watching it on loop, man? Man, I, I kind of, I'm like dead fish. I usually only watch it once or twice right before the night. Mm -hmm. All right, there you go. Uh, let's see here. Coach Lynn says, who is the tackle that played basketball in college and is making the switch to football and is rising up draft boards? That's Giovanni Manu. And he's, he also goes by Werner Manu. I've seen that on a couple of boards. The thing about him, let me uh, pop my board up here real quick. It's so hard to find information on him because he's just he's just one of those prospects that's kind of, uh, kind of tough to uh, to get info on. This may be a little bit hard to read. I'll try to bring it in here a little closer for you guys and gals so you can see it. But I'm to the final stage of building my board here. Ooh, that looks weird. No, here we go. Let me drop this down here. Um, the green column on the right is the final grade, but as we search for my new here, I want you to kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, so I've got him right now sitting in the 229 spot. Okay. And if you scroll down here and look at him, um, some people have him listed as a tackle. It sounds like he's going to be an interior offensive lineman. If I read correctly, his RAS as an interior offensive lineman ends up being an eight plus. Um, so he, uh, he's sitting on the consensus big board in the 340 spot right now. So it sounds like he's probably going to be an undrafted free agent, but there's like multiple teams. There's like seven or eight teams that have visited with him. Okay. That have, I think brought him in on top 30 visits maybe. So that as a team, as an organization, if you're the Packers, you've got to be sitting there going, okay, we better draft him in the seventh round or somebody's going to sign him as a undrafted free agent. And then it turns into, <laughs> multiple people on him maybe we need to use a six round pick right the market's going to kind of drive up on him because he is getting a lot of attention there so um what do you think about my new jacob the basketball i don't know if you've seen the videos on twitter that dude looks athletic as all get out man yeah um he's like you said it's just tough to find a lot of info on him other than that i mean it's in like coach says he's intriguing he's got good footwork so i i would i would love it you know I got to hop off, guys. Have a good rest of the show. Go, Pat, go. All right. See you, buddy. Have a good day. See you, guys. What do you think about Manu? You got anything on him uh, there, Tim? No, not much. Um, but, you know, and we've got to consider any and all options, right? You know, mm -hmm. we talked about uh, putting an emphasis on, uh, you know, we've got positional needs here going into the draft. But, you know, it these games are won and lost in the trenches, not to sound cliche, but whether it's the O line or the D line, we've got to look at getting better and building towards the future. So I think any, any athletic freak at tackle is someone you got to have your eye on. It's just, there's not a lot on this guy um, right mm -hmm. now. Definitely. So this is the reason I'm a little bit weary about him. This was his consensus big board ranking all year long. If you go back to January at the end of the college football season, 627th on the consensus big board. And then on April 2nd, Tim, I don't know what it was, but he woke up just a little bit better, buddy. He jumps all the way to 345, <laughs> and it's because of all this interest around him, right? So now people are starting to put him on the consensus big boards like, hey, okay, he may get drafted in the sixth or seventh round. Did we bring him in for a visit? We did, yep. That's okay. Great. Yeah, so pretty sure we did, yeah. Um, I know he's, he's definitely on Green Bay's – radar there was like eight or nine teams that that were taking a look at him so um gonna be interesting to see where he goes uh his percentage of being in the first round is one tenth of a percent though so probably not gonna go in the first right right <laughs> i won't be trading up to get this guy <laughs> right right so uh here's a couple of 2024 mocks that has him um i'm guessing is that what that is 
that he might be mentioned on the mock. If that's the case, then they're saying that the Bucks took him in round seven. So um, I believe that's what that info is there. So interesting stuff. I think there. it could be a UDFA, but, you know, I don't know. He's getting a lot of attention here, right? Probably probably does get picked up in the mid to later rounds. You never know. Yeah. Right. Could be. Um, let's see what else we got here in the chat. Just want to make sure I'm not uh, missing anything else. Coach Lynn says uh, there's some really good offensive linemen late in the draft. I completely agree. Um, yeah, let's see what else we got. Pro day. Packers also went to Manu's pro day. So if he, I'm pretty sure he was a top 30 visit. Yeah, they're confirming top 30. Well, it should show on my board. I've got it marked there. Yeah, he was definitely a top 30 visit. I've got it right here. Again, most people see him as an interior offensive line. It sounds like I just put O line on him. Um, and as we get closer to the draft, we'll cry, try to suffer through everything and figure out, you know, exactly what position he is going to play. So, um, yeah, so there is that. Now, there was something else I wanted to hit on before we wrap this big bear up, Tim. Um, oh, just to kind of recap, there's probably many people that missed the show yesterday. Um, I don't blame you. The show sucks, but we appreciate you swinging through today. Um, we did a, uh, a a listener had asked us to do a mock draft where we trade up to 16. You guys know whether the, the reports are accurate or not. Yardbarker.com was reporting that there were several teams interested in trading up the Seattle Seahawks at 16. The Packers were one of those teams. That could have meant that the Packers just called them, right? But we had a listener say, hey, what would that look like? And, Tim, we got to be 100% transparent here. Like, we we were not looking forward to this, were we, trading up to 16? No. Because we're team trade back. So yep. this was a pleasant surprise. We traded up to 16 before the draft even started. So it wasn't like, hey – Let's wait for a guy to drop, then we'll trade up. We just said, all right, let's just pull the trigger before the draft starts. Let's get the 16th pick. Let's roll with it and see who's there. We were able to get Quinion Mitchell, cornerback out of Toledo, um, with the 16th pick. Now, where does he fall on my board? He is my best, unless it's changed here with the most recent grade adjustment here, he should be the best corner in the draft, unless, like I said this morning, I added in some of the final stages here. Let me drop this down real quick, and we'll get back to the mock draft. So, the yeah, I've got him in the 10 spot. Well, the 9 spot, actually. So, if Goody's board looked like mine right here, it means you've got the ninth best prospect, right, at 16. And that's what we're talking about. We were just talking about those 69 and 70 grades. There's a good chance there's a 69 grade on Quinion Mitchell, and you turn around and you, bang, that's a high-end starter that you just absolutely nailed in the draft. That's really exciting stuff. That's why it's important to talk about the potential trade-up opportunities. We don't want to create a, create a narrative where it's like, okay, yeah, this is what they're going to do. But it's important to kind of keep your eye on that stuff. The grading scale, again, a 67 to a 69 is a strong starter. So you're talking about someone who not all pro potential, but one of those guys that's going to be one of the better starters in the league, right? Probably probably a 70, 70 plus grade, right, Tim? So yep. That's Absolutely. what we're able to nab there um, when it comes to the mock that we did. Now, um, with the 41st pick, we took Tyler Newbin, right? Safety out of Minnesota. Surprise, surprise. Then at 58, we were still able to get Christian Haynes. At 91, we got Jeremiah Trotter Jr. So essentially, you got an outside cornerback to start opposite Jair Alexander. You don't have to slap that $12 million uh, fifth year option. On Eric Stokes, you can just let him test the market next year, and if he comes back with no market, then you can sign him to a, a, a bargain of a deal. But Quinion Mitchell opposite Jair Alexander, Tyler Newbin playing that box safety position alongside Xavier McKinney, your new shiny toy there from free agency. Then you get Christian Haynes with the number 58 pick to plug and play at right guard, right? So you've now – you've added yep. three starters in the draft. Oh, by the way, at 91, you take Jeremiah Trotter Jr., if you take Jeremiah Trotter Jr., he's more of a will. That would suggest you are going to have to play Quay at the mic, which, you know, Quay being a little bit taller, 6'2", 6'3", whatever he is, that kind of matches the prototypical mic linebacker. So with the first – give uh, Zay McDuffie a shot at the mic. You never know. Yeah. With the first four picks here, you really got potential to land four starters, and that's that's really exciting. I didn't think I was going to like this draft this much, Tim, but, man, I'm telling you, I came away going, that is absolutely awesome. To land the best.
Tim, sir, can you hear me? I can hear you, Clay. <laughs> All right. The power just went out. I'm sitting in the dark right now on my phone. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good timing, though. We're at the 50-minute mark. We're actually going to finish on time today, guys. That's kind of wow. cool. So <laughs> we just, like I said, wanted to hit on this draft. Hopefully you can hear me okay. We'll wrap it up really, really quick to mention the other picks here for those of you on the pod. Um, round five, Tim, if you can be ready to end the stream when we get done here, I sure. greatly appreciate that. Yep. And um, we'll, we'll have to end Rumble a different way. But uh, I'll take care of that. You can just leave the studio when we wrap up. So with the, I think it's, uh, what pick is that, Tim? 169, kind of hard to see here. 169, we took tackle Jalen Sundell, um, which is a, a prospect that's rising on my board pretty quickly. I didn't know anything about him. We uncovered him in these exercises we've been doing. Then we went with safety Omar Brown at 202, someone who's versatile, could play the slot. And then at Two, I think it's 219. We went with halfback Isaiah Davis out of South Dakota State, another Jackrabbit. That dude was the highest graded running back in all of college football last year. Um, really, really high zone grade as well. And then Dallas Gant out of Toledo. That's Quinion Mitchell's teammate there. Um, one of the higher graded uh, linebackers, according to PFF. We got him at pick 245. And then, of course, Jarius Monroe, cornerback out of Tulane, another very, very highly graded uh, prospect, according to PFF. Um, we got him with the final pick there at 255. They gave us an A minus Tim. I think this is the highest grade that we've gotten um, on any mock draft we've done this year. And it's hilarious yeah. that we traded up, right? Yeah, absolutely. We did not expect this. Um, and like you said, I don't think we expected to do, uh, smack it out of the park like this um, with some of these uh, picks that we got. I mean, there's a lot of value here. You're right. It is based on the grade. It's one of our better drafts, which is a little shocking <laughs> considering all the all the effort we put into our other ones and we decided to go ahead and uh you know roll the dice with a trade up and this is how it looks i'm i'm surprised as well at how how nice this draft does look yeah for sure man uh coach Lennon, this is actually easier than the computer doing it on the phone this is wild hopefully the quality isn't horrible but <laughs> coach lynn says sundale is a steal completely agree there sdm 40 says technical difficulties um, yeah, you know, anytime the power goes out here, Tim, I go back to the housing projects days in the trailer park and I think, did we pay the bill? That's what I immediately think. <laughs> you start looking around at the street lights outside and stuff like if the street it's lights on, <laughs> if the street lights on and your power's off, something went wrong, guys. All right. So you're uh, yeah, that's the way it is. Appreciate it, Dave. It'll come back on soon. I'm sure it's beautiful out here. We're probably just cleaning stuff up from the wind. I would say the power board got out there and taking care of some stuff. So uh, they always have everybody's best interests at heart. Right, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> you know how that is. <laughs> I love it. Coach Lynn said, take a look at Jordan McGee, linebacker from Mississippi State. I think I added him last night, actually. Um, pretty solid prospect. So there you go. Um, let's see. Ron Samble said, did you have any, did you have another trade up to 16 option? Um Meaning uh, what player you would – you're talking about like options as far as players to draft. If that's the case, we looked at it, didn't we, Tim? Quinion Mitchell, hands down, was the best the best player available. He was. I think we went into it trying to grab a Mike linebacker originally we were thinking of, mm -hmm. and uh, that didn't happen. And then, um, you know, we, we basically look at position and need, but we also looked at best available and kind of got two birds with one stone, right? Yeah, Covered absolutely. Covered position and need and got an absolute stud, so – Definitely. All right. As we get ready to wrap up here, Tim, you got anything else, buddy? We're, we're ending early. This was God intervening right here with the power going out. So. Well, speaking of God intervening, um, I want to give a shout out to our, our boy Packer Bobby, you know, Packer owner on Twitter. Um, he just posted something. Uh, he's going to be a father. He's very excited. Let's so uh, congratulations to Bobby Anderson down there. Uh, Green Bay by way of Atlanta. He's back down in Atlanta now, but, uh, our buddy from uh, Green Bay for sure. So congratulations to uh, to Bobby and the misses. Uh, they're expecting. So we had to give him a shout out for sure. Absolutely. You're not going to find a nicer guy, man. That dude is just top notch. He's top shelf. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're not going to do any outro, Tim. We'll just uh, we'll end it here. Keep in mind, Rumble will still be live. So we'll just exit the studio. I'll hop over to Rumble on my phone and see if we can end it that way. So it doesn't run for however many hours the power is out here. <laughs> so we'll okay. see if we can figure that out. But uh, really appreciate everybody hanging out with us in the chat. This was a lot of fun. Tim, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to thank Jacob. Hopped on here before he uh, headed out to church. So appreciate him um, getting on and talking a little ball with us. So we will see you guys possibly mid-afternoon. I may do a stream if the power's back on. 
We'll definitely be back for PTA live tonight at 7 Central, 8 Eastern, trying to get all these exercises in, though, middays and stuff um, on the weekend when I got a little extra time off and uh, gather all this information. And the draft's going to be here. I mean, it's just wild. I'm expecting to have about 50 people at my house on this coming Saturday. And then the following Thursday is the first round of the draft. And Emilio is going to drop in on Friday night. So it's like, I've got so much to get done around the house that it ain't even funny. So I got to get out here and get some chainsaw therapy in. But there Tim, you thank you. For, thank you for your time, man. I really appreciate you, buddy. Always happy to be here, man. Looking forward to uh, you getting your power back on. We'll do this again soon. All right, buddy. We'll just go ahead and exit out of the studio here, guys. We'll see you tonight. Everybody have a blessed day.